Okay, so today we're going to combine chapter 17, and this is um, computers in um, medicinal chemistry. And then we're also going to talk about chapter 18, and that is QSAR. So we've talked about structure activity relationships. The Q stands for quantitative. And the goal for each one of these quantitative structure activity relationships is to generate a formula that can be used to quantitatively um, compare different molecules. A lot of times it's easier to make a decision on a molecule if you have a number. Okay, so in chapter 17, we talk about different chemical, uh, different computers. And computers uh, use algorithms to calculate structure and property data for a molecule. And um, some of these algorithms are based on molecular mechanics. which is just basically physics, classical physics equations. And they also focus on quantum mechanics. When you think of quantum mechanics, you want to think of more of the electrons. Now, your choice of method for these different um, computer calculations can be um, to minimize energy. So that's usually a goal. That means they're going to be more stable. Um, it's used to identify stable conformation. So we're going to look at rotations around the bonds. Um, there's also energy calculations for these different uh, conformations. And um, heats of formation. So some of the quantum mechanics really look at um, molecular orbital energies. So they'll look at the HOMO and the LUMO, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital and highest occupied molecular orbital. They'll look at formations for um, heat of formation for different conformations. Uh, they also look at electrical potentials, dipole moments. And so each one of these are evaluated. Another uh, computer tool is ChemDraw. And there's different types of ChemDraw. ChemDraw is actually uh, a chemistry drawing program. Um, but in industry, I used a thing called ISIS, which is a little different. Um, these computer programs can help you draw structures. You can see the structures in 3D. They can predict the IUPAC chemical name for the structures. They can predict boiling points and melting points and proton NMR and carbon NMR peaks, they can predict IR peaks. So those computer um, packages are really good. Um, and those help you with viewing 3D molecules. The ones we're going to really focus on in chapter 17 though is how to optimize a lead compound. So how to use computers to optimize a lead compound or even to identify a lead compound. And so um, to do this, usually these compounds will have algorithms to um, differentiate between the different molecular properties. And so some molecular properties might be uh, bond angles, torsional angles, 
These are a lot of times the dihedral angle that we look at with Newman projections, dipole-dipole interactions, partial charges. Uh, a lot of times they uh, use molecular electrostatic potentials. And these are really good. They look at the molecule as a whole, and they'll determine where there's elect high electron density compared to maybe another area where there's low electron density because the molecule as a whole will generate a dipole moment. Um, like I said, it can use uh, molecular orbitals, the highest occupied molecular orbitals and the lowest. Um, a lot of programs will divide the molecular properties into grids and then these areas will be considered fields. And it's a way to um, figure out maybe a 3D grid because your molecular target, your biological target is 3D. So if you find that you have a high electron density over here, maybe low over here, then you can also explore the space in that grid. Um, a lot of times these molecules will get rotated and continuously rotated. Uh, so if you have bonds, you could imagine um, a molecule such as this, you can rotate around the single bonds. And so the conformation could change something like this. Now, of course, the double bonds here and the amides are going to be rigid. But you could see if you had a space in your biological target here that was having some kind of van der Waals interaction uh, versus space here, that free rotation, that conformation could be evaluated and predicted and this is usually explored by um, trying to find the lowest energy. And so these each rotation will um, produce the lowest energy. So one of the things that a lot of the programs will focus on is a conformational analysis. And your book talks about this on page 358. And so what's happening is a lot of times you can get um, each one of these bonds, you can do a stepwise bond rotation. And you can try to find the overall global minimum energy. Um, some programs that do this are called the Monte Carlo and the Metropolis method. And if I were you, I'd read that on page 360 and 361 for your quiz. And it talks about how these um, methods are looking for that conformational analysis. And um, you might want to compare how they're similar and how they're different in trying to find that conformational analysis. Um, some programs will do a structure overlay. So um, a lot of times you find the pharmacophore, which we did this in one of our Pogel exercises, and you can find that pharmacophore, and that is very important for the binding activity. And then you can overlay molecules and see if those pharmacophores are similar. Now, the important thing is how do you determine the active conformation 
of your target molecule of your target. Um, so just because we have the primary structure and the secondary structure of proteins of a peptide bond, well, they fold, right? And they interact with each other to make a 3D structure. And in that structure, you have the folding and then you have active sites. And we've talked about how different um, conformations of the protein will determine whether something is an agonist or an antagonist. And if we want to design an, an agonist, then we want the ligand to bind the active site in such a way that it does an induced fit to be an agonist. So we want to turn on that activity. Well, the easiest way, the best way, is if you have an x-ray crystal of your um, target, your protein peptide target, your biological target, bound to the lichen, to the drug molecule. And if you can do that, then you're able to um, compare rigid and non-rigid ligands, and you could identify a pharmacophore. You can compare compounds. So that is the best way, is if you can get an x-ray crystal structure. Um, and then you can have other computer programs that will do different docking procedures. So some of the different docking procedures, and you do have these in your um, in your slides. If you look in your slides, uh, one of them it talks about using the cannoli surface. This is also page 369 in your book, and so once you have the X-ray structure. And you can kind of then fill out your space for your binding site. And you treat each atom like a sphere. Okay, so then that kind of defines the shape of your active site, the binding site. And that's called the cannoli surface. You also have, so you can dock things by uh, just the shape of your molecule. You can um, focus on certain parts that are going to be rigid and ones that are going to be more flexible. Um, another method is called um, the click technique. And this will dock, it will focus on hydrogen bond donors and hydrogen bond acceptors. And it will predominantly use the hydrogen bond within that binding site as a starting point for docking that molecule and then finding those lower energies. The other uh, program is called FLOG, and FLOG is on page 373. It's called Flexible Ligands Oriented on Grid. So Flexible Ligand Oriented on Grids. And um, this one basically tries to find 10 to 20 different conformations for each ligand, and then it tries to um, put these constructs together on a grid. Um, the ligand is fragmented and anchored. The other one is it called an anchor and grow technique 
and this will focus on um, rotatable bonds. They also look at the rigid and the flexible areas, but the molecule is actually split into fragments, and these fragments are anchored um, into that active site by maybe that amino acid, and then you put fragments together. You guys have already kind of done this. We didn't use a computer program, but one of your quizams, you actually took fragments of a drug molecule and you proposed an, a new active lead compound based on um, intermolecular forces. So that's how the computers use those different docking programs. The other one, if you actually go onto your next slide, it's called de novo drug design. And so the de novo drug design is what I actually uh, remember doing. Um, we actually didn't have an x-ray crystal structure at the time, which would have been really nice. We would, um, but we would work with the computer people at Eli Lilly. And we had this guy, and we would see him probably every other week. And we would put on these 3D glasses, and we would go and sit in his office, and we would look at this big screen, and we would get an idea based on energies of what our active binding site looked like. And we had our lead compound, and so we would figure out how it was oriented based on these different amino acids. So we would say, okay, that's a key amino acid, this is a key amino acid, and this is a key amino acid. So we might have three key amino acids. We would know their intermolecular binding types, whether it's a hydrogen bonding or electrostatic or van der Waals. And then we would put different functional groups on our molecule, and then we would test that compound. We would usually let the computer predict about two compounds per week, and we would have to synthesize this, and, um, and then that data was fed into their molecular modeling system to find those lower energy conformations and try to predict that next molecule. And that's what um, de novo drug design is. You actually have the crystallized protein and ligand by the X-ray crystallography, and then you identify the binding site, you identify binding interactions, and um, then you work together to produce molecules to see if you can get that conformational fit. Um, two of the programs that it talks about is Ludi and Sprout. And um, these are automated programs that will actually fit the molecular fragments into the different binding sites. So you can kind of look at that. Uh, the typical intermolecular forces are electrostatic bonding, hydrogen bonding, and you can use your different fragments. And you've done a little bit of this in your um, your in your quizams. All right, so let's switch gears now to chapter 18 and talk about some of these important parameters. Um, for quantitative SAR. So QSAR. And this is chapter 18. This will be our last chapter in here. Um, um, so the goal here for QSAR is to evaluate physicochemical properties. So we're going to have to define what those physicochemical properties are, and we want to get a formula. Okay, so we're thinking of graphs and equations. And so you're going to evaluate, um, so if you take a parameter that you want to evaluate, let's say log 1 over C, this is your binding activity. So C is the concentration of the drug that um, produces your biological activity. And this is measured on the y-axis. And then the parameter that you want to evaluate, let's say 
um, is log p. Do you remember what log p is? Log p is um, evaluated with the octanol over the water. And if you have a high concentration of your drug in the octanol, then it has it's more hydrophobic. And this is a good predictor of how drugs will um, be able to cross uh, cell membranes. So if you get um, some measurements here, then this graph here, this line, um, is called a linear regression. So this is your linear regression analysis. And you evaluate this by least squares method. And you can just check this when you're doing Excel. And that is your best fit. And that always comes with an R correlation. So usually N is your number of um, experiments your sample size, and then you get uh, an R, which is your regression. And so let's say this is 990. That's a good correlation. OK, so this evaluates your correlation to your parameter with your, in this case, your biological activity. If you want that as close to 1 as you can get. And then this S, when you get the S here, that is your standard deviation, how far these points are from this linear best fit line. So all of these tests need to be evaluated in some form of graph. And so what are these physico-chemical properties? OK. And so I will go ahead and tell you. Um, Well, let's see. Basically, these are them. So you want to do hydrophobicity. OK, so hydrophobicity. And that's what we've been talking about with the log P. We're also going to talk about um, another thing, and it's going to be the pi. And this is a, for the substituent. OK, so you got that for the molecule and the hydrophobicity for the substituent. So this is like the functional group that you put on. If you put a substituent onto an, um, a benzene ring, so you go from a benzene ring to maybe a chlorobenzene ring, then that pi will determine the hydrophobicity. The other uh, physico chemical property are electronic properties of the substituents. And that's going to be the sigma. And this is of the substituent. And the other one we want to look at is uh, steric properties of the substituent. And that's called the TAF parameter. OK, so that's called TAF. So you need to read each, a little bit about each one of these. Um, and how they're evaluated. So just learn about each one of those. And um, then the different ways. Yeah, so Taft here. Let me fix this. So the Taft is the ES parameter. There are about four ways that we bring these together to evaluate. And one of those is the Hansch equation. We'll talk about the Craig plot. Um, the topless scheme. And we can talk about bioisosteres and the free Wilson approach. OK, so let's um, make a chart of these five and talk about how each one of those methods um, evaluate 
these physicochemical properties different. Um, for the Hans equation, so so. This is a QSAR, and it relates various physico-chemical properties with the biological activity. And it does a series of compounds. So you have to have a series of compounds. They're very similar to the target example would be like log 1 over C, and then you would get an equation like 1.22 pi minus 1.59 sigma plus 7.89. Okay, so what parameters? This is the linear fit. The data has been evaluated. You get a linear regression. Um, the pi here would be the hydrophobicity properties of the different substituents. This would be the, co uh, the coefficient factor. Over here, the sigma. This is the electronic effects. And they each, you can look in charts and you can see numbers equated with these different substituents. So as you can see, the activity increases with an increase of hydrophobicity of different substituents by a factor of 1.24 and the electronic effects by 1.59. Now the Craig plot. What does the Craig plot do? It will evaluate two different physico-chemical properties. Um, for various substituents. So we're looking at two different properties and we want to see how pi versus um, sigma. So the hydrophobicity would be, let's say, on the um, x-axis and then your electronic could be on the y-axis. And then you can fill in the grid here and you would fill in the data because you would get numerical data and then you could um, physically see that in a Craig plot. Okay, for a topless scheme, it's used to decide which substituents um, to use if you're going to optimize a lead. This is when um, synthesis is hard. The, simple, the synthesis is slow and complex. Then you're going to want to use a topless scheme. So basically you say, okay, what if I make this change? It's really a flow chart, okay, folks? It's just a flow chart. If I make this change from a hydrogen to a chlorine, then you evaluate it as either low activity or it could be E, equal activity, or it could be uh, M, which is more activity. And you basically make those decisions so that way you don't make a lot of changes and you can minimize how many changes you have to make. Okay, the other two we have is bioisosteres and you get um, basically all the different substituents you get a chart, you can look these up, the chart of the different substituents. And you can choose ones that have similar physico chemical properties. So you've been doing this already, but now you can look at charts with those actual numbers for those parameters, such as pi or sigma. And then the free Wilson approach. The Free-Wilson approach um, will 
basically focus on the biological activity of a parent molecule measured, and then they compare arranged against substituted analogs. Um, I would think that what I've done probably is more of a free Wilson approach. So you look at the, the parent molecule, and this is what you've all been doing, and then you make changes, you make structural changes, and then you compare the two. And you decide is that functional group um, contribution um, adds value or not. And so these are the different approaches you can use in um, quantitative SAR.